Good morning, Bobcats for Business. I realize this may not be morning there, but um, my my track for, for uh, classroom presentations is always an entry with Good Morning Milledgeville, and I'm pretty sure most of you aren't in Milledgeville. Uh, I've been asked to do a presentation in this uh, COVID environment for Bobcats for Business on, on entrepreneurship. Uh, my name is Dr. Bob Dusing, and I do teach entrepreneurship as well as uh, strategic management at Georgia College. And so I thought I would uh, give you a, a view of maybe what, what Georgia College looks like now. You, you probably recognize that building right there, Atkinson Hall, nice fountain, beautiful, right? But over here, maybe not so much. Uh, we've got this big billboard sign here, keep GC safe. It's on, um, it's on a trailer, let me get out of the way, uh, on a Georgia College uh, campus police trailer there. They've uh, loaned us to um, keep, uh, keep GC safe and keep the, uh, the impression of, um, of wearing masks in, uh, in the front of our minds so that we keep everybody safe. So this is kind of what the, what the environment looks like now on campus. Um, I think I may have had some of you in class. I have been here for, this is my 11th year now. So I've been teaching on, on campus for, uh, since 2009. So I may have had you in class. If you've seen any of these ideas or, or, or uh, jokes before, just pretend like they're brand new, <laughs> okay? Uh, I've never done a presentation like this on video, so I'm just hoping it all works and, uh, and uh, it sounds smooth. I know there's going to be some clunkiness to it just because uh, that's the nature of the beast and, and uh, this isn't my, <laughs> my choice of, of, of presentation uh, um, delivery methods, but, but we'll get through it. I wanted to show you, uh, I did a PowerPoint presentation for you just kind of keep me on track and I want to show that to you, but before I start that, um, you know, with this COVID environment that we're in and, uh, and uh, being asked to speak about entrepreneurship in that in that environment, um, there I really had a, a tough time struggling with what to uh, what to present to you because um, the businesses that you represent and I looked at all the um, uh, the members to, in this Bobcats for Business. You know, it's all over the board, uh, different industries, different types of businesses, and so. Um, there's really no way to, um, I think, deliver one message that would be applicable to all or even even most of you. And so um, when I do consulting, I can be a, a much more focused, but I think in this regard, with so many different potential audience members, I had to sort of back up and, and become a little bit more general about, about the presentation. So um, that's kind of where I'm starting from. Uh, let me see if I can first share the screen with you. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's see how this works. Okay, I want to share a PowerPoint presentation with you and uh, go into a video, I'm sorry, into a presentation mode with that presentation. And there you should see it. Uh, the title of that presentation, Strategy for a COVID-Constrained Environment, Back to Basics. So that's kind of where I'm starting here. Um, realizing all of you are in business now, uh, I also know from consulting that oftentimes you may have gone through a lot of planning process, hopefully before uh, starting the business, but once you're down that road for a while, uh, things are coming so so fast and furious that you really, um, you really haven't had time to sort of stop action and uh, analyze where you are and, and maybe how you got there or even where you want to go more importantly. So, so that's kind of where I'm starting from. Um, given that this is a, um, a pandemic time, I know that's the overshadowing, uh, overarching concern here, but let's for a moment, let's, let's back up and think about how you got to, to where you are. And that's, uh, that's the whole strategy perspective of, of entrepreneurship. And so uh, the agenda I put together starts with 
uh, SWOT analysis. I'm not going to do a SWOT analysis, uh, but I want to talk about some of the aspects of a SWOT analysis and how that can be helpful, again, in this environment. Um, after a SWOT analysis, we'll go into Porter's Five Forces. And you may remember that if you, if you went through any of my classes, we always talk about Porter's Five Forces. Um, and I look at this as kind of a funnel. So we're at the top end of the funnel and getting narrower and narrower. Porter's Five Forces is, a, is an industry level uh, of analysis and the strategy matrix is also an industry level, but we can bring that down to, uh, to the firm level, to your business level. And then believe it or not, since I do teach uh, for a living, I'm going to give you homework. So the rest of this is, uh, is homework. Um, and that's vision, that's really based on the, um, the SWOT, the, the five forces and the strategy matrix we did. Now, that vision is um, basically a new vision. I want you to think about uh, where, where you're going to go uh, from here, given this pandemic environment. So from vision, we go to mission, and then uh, finally goal setting. And those things are going to be for homework, like I said, the vision, mission, and goal setting are things then that you really need to do at an individual level rather than in, in this sort of um, uh, group uh, sort of uh, setting or group uh, presentation. Okay, um, next thing is I've got a little short video here. So again, here comes the clunkiness. <laughs> I need to stop sharing that screen and I want to share a different one. So let's see, uh, just disregard all the, the clicking. <laughs> Let me get that screen up. And the video is uh, only about a minute and a half long, but, uh, but I think you'll find it interesting. So um, here we go. Let me get that full screen and uh, that's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? It's kind of fun. No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello! There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? <laughs> I don't believe this. You gotta be kidding me. I'm gonna cry. Well, something else left to do. <laughs> stop sharing this so that we don't start something new. We don't need anything new in there. Let me get my PowerPoint uh, back up and then we'll, we'll uh, start this again. Let's see. I want to start sharing that and get that into presentation mode. and get us back to where we started. So, what did you think about that? I love the video about this, <laughs> this escalator. There's uh, these two people on the escalator. You know who those two people are, right? Those, those, those are our small business owners today, right? They are out in this elevator and all of a sudden, boom! Something happens, uh, we've been thrown for a loop. 
Um, you know, we have no idea how to get out of it. The solution could be pretty simple. I think you probably all would admit, but um, you know, sometimes it's just hard to see when it's right, even when it's right in front of us. Um, you see the guy coming with, with the toolbox, you know who that is, right? Um, that's our, those are our um, governmental leaders. Um, and he may have uh, PPP in that, uh, in that toolbox. He might have unemployment checks. Uh, they might get to you, they may not. We have no idea. If you stand on that escalator and just wait for somebody else to help, it's gonna be a problem. So we need to take matters into our own hands. We need to figure out how to put one foot in front of the other and get off of the dang escalator, right? So that's, uh, that's my two cents. Let's see if we can find out uh, how to do that. And the way I wanna do it is again, kind of back to basics, let's look at the SWOT analysis, right? And the SWOT analysis is next, there we go. So y'all know what that is, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, just as a review, the strengths and weaknesses are internal to an organization. So those are your strengths, your weaknesses, and opportunities and threats are things that are perceived in the external environment. So uh, opportunities are things that I always say we want to um, take advantage of. Uh, the green arrow means we are going to be on the offensive. We want to find any opportunities out there and then hopefully have some of our strengths pointed towards them. And on the other hand, the red arrow, we're looking at potential threats. When we find threats in the environment, identify those things, we're going to be on the defense then. We're going to try to guard against, to build a barrier, a wall, or something to where the threats can't take advantage of our of our weaknesses. So think about strengths and weaknesses internal to your organization right now. What are you strong at? What are you weak at? We already know opportunities and threats. We know that threat out there, and that's the COVID thing that, that we're talking about primarily, but there are a lot of other threats out there as well. And then what opportunities? You know, some businesses are um, just flat, flat down doing no business to 25% business at this point. And other ones are even busier than they ever were just because of the type of business. So again, I wanna be a little bit more general about it. Um, and that really takes us into to the next phase or screen. Once we have an idea of that SWOT analysis, our own strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, we wanna take a look at the external environment. So this external environment is um, in, in this case, in this external environment, we're looking at what's called the general environment. So we show seven characteristics here, and, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about those either, but those are all future focused, or we should think about them is in terms of future focus. So when you think about COVID and the pandemic, you might look and say, okay, where, where is that? Is that, um, is that in the economic environment? Is that political legal? Is that uh, sociocultural? I mean, is it global? It could physical, it could, it could transcend uh, most of those things. So don't just think about COVID in terms of this general environment, but essentially other characteristics from all seven of these. The economic environment, what do you see coming down again? Future focus, what do you see the economy doing in the next six months to a year? Do you see COVID still being here? Do we need to adjust to that completely for the long run? Is it a short, short game that we're playing? Um, political legal, we all know that that's gonna be a wild card um, come November with the presidential election. So there's going to uh, possibly be changes there. Um, we're not sure. Technology, can that help in the COVID environment? Um, I've got uh, um, a lot of places that I'm uh, spending money now where um, they want to be totally, um, you know, a touch-free environment um, where they're not just delivering pizzas on the porch, but I'm um, getting credit cards back wrapped in a, in a, uh, in a, in a wipe that has um, an alcohol base to it. So basically trying to protect uh, everything. So, you know, what's, what's this technology, what, what can we do to make that even friendlier for, um, for a less, um, touch environment, type environment. 
and, and global from that perspective too. Um, do you have a, a global impact? You may not have customers that are global, but do you have suppliers that bring goods from overseas? And, and we all know that that's been a problem in some areas in the past. What do you see in the next six months to a year? Um, the physical environment, again, same, same type of thing with, um, with the interaction, individual interaction. Are you in the people business? Um, are you selling a product or service where you really need to um, interact with, with individuals? Then that physical environment has probably had to be adjusted. I know for sure our classrooms have been adjusted um, quite, quite dramatically. Um, sociocultural, so hopefully this, um, the, the society at large isn't um, going to have to adapt to, to a new norm here in terms of mask wearing and distances and stuff, and things like that for, for the long run, but um, how long might it be and how, uh, how accustomed are your customers to doing that or, or um, you know, how, how averse to doing that are they? And in demographics, so when you think about demographics in terms of um, a lot of different uh, aspects, whether it's uh, age, uh, race, or um, um, even even um, physical locations, uh, maybe your customers are are not. Uh, maybe your cu customers are not uh, end users. Maybe you're more of a a B two B kind of a business, and so in that case, uh, demographics might be a little bit different. So in summary, with the external environment, though, we wanna look at all seven of these factors and just what does the future portend? So think about the next six to 12 months, where do you see the general environment? How do you see the general environment changing in, in respects to, uh, to your business, your, your industry? All right, and then, oh, Dilbert. <laughs> COVID has not only affected businesses. So any of you that are working from home may, uh, may recognize this, uh, dogs, cats, what have you. They're probably wondering, when are you going to leave? They're uh, hoping that you'll uh, <laughs> leave the house to them uh, for some time. Um, it's always nice to be, uh, for Dilbert to be told off by dog bird there. <laughs> so. Um, there's always a lot of, seems like a lot of truth in that. So one other measure of, um, of the external environment is Porter's Five Forces. We'll spend a little bit more time talking about this. Um, Porter's Five Forces is, is um, not necessarily future focused as was uh, the general environment, but, but this one is focused more on profitability. And it's, it's looking at well, I always like to draw where the circle in the center, it says rivalry. I always like to draw you or whatever your business is within that same circle. Um, the rivalries are basically your direct competitors, right? And so you and your rivals are existing in that same space, um, vying for market share. And you're hoping you can have as many of those arrows pointing out as possible. So in other words, if you look left to right and think about supply chain, you know, what are the, how are, how strong are the, is the power of your suppliers? How strong is the power, power of your buyers? And are you able to, to exert pressure on them or is it the opposite? Um, and an up top threat of new entrants, can you exert pressure on those new entrants to keep them from coming into your space? And on the bottom threat of substitutes, are there substitutes out there that, could do the same thing basically as what you do and are you able to keep them out of your space so again all five of these four and the fifth one obviously are your rivals but um, all five of those the objective is to have the arrows pointing out um, to where you have a more more or less a protected space market share in order to do business so we'll talk about those uh, a little bit more the threat of new entrance at the top is the one where we'll start and we'll just come around. So a threat of new entrants, um, think about any other business that may be coming into your market space. Um, you know, how great is that threat? Are they going to bring additional capacity to which you, you may already be tapped out and they're going to be able to overtake you with that additional capacity? 
Um, it's a two-factor threat. Uh, barriers to entry is the one and expected retaliation is the other. So barriers to entry is, is a big one. Are there economies of scale there that, um, that you could utilize or that you could take advantage of that could ramp up production if you needed it? And when I say production, it could also be service oriented. But are you able to ramp up that, uh, that production in order to take advantage of some economy of scale to keep a new entrant from, from moving in, especially if they're bringing additional capacity? Uh, product differentiation, how different is your uh, product or your service? We're going to talk about strategy next, <clears throat> and that's one of the aspects of it, uh, but differentiation is something that uh, most everybody's going to look for. Why, why should I buy from you versus some, someone else? And especially, again, with the COVID environment, you know, are you, are you, uh, are you providing something different there in order to make those customers feel just as safe and comfortable about buying from you or hopefully more so than they would someone else. Um, what are the capital requirements? If there's huge capital requirements in your particular business, then there's sort of a built-in um, uh, power to keep those new entrants out because new entrants are going to have to come with huge capital uh, outlay in order to, to get into that business. Uh, what are the switching costs? So do your you're, um, uh, are, are you able to, to move from this business or your, your new entrants, are they able to, to move from their business into yours very easily? Or is, is there a high amount of, of cost involved in them switching businesses? And we'll talk about switching costs too with, with buyers. It'll come maybe a little bit uh, more clearly. And then access to distribution channels. So do the new entrants have the same access to distribution as you do? Um, do you have some agreements for distribution channels that perhaps uh, keep that more, more, uh, more protected? Um, and then expected retaliation. Could there be a, a, a high expectation of, of you retaliating against the new entrant coming in to, to defend that? Uh, that market space. If there is, then that, that weighs um, in favor of you, right? <clears throat> so let's move on to the, the more the supply chain with the power of suppliers and power of buyers. Um, and we're looking at when, uh, power, uh, when suppliers are powerful. So if there's just a few of them in the marketplace, you don't have many choices, much selection of suppliers, and that's going to give them more power than you. If there aren't many substitutes, the same, same thing. Um, if you're just a small customer, you're not a big buyer from them, the, the power is gonna be with that supplier too. Um, especially if those goods are critical, if that's something you really need. And then again, we see switching costs. So how difficult is it um, for you um, to, switch, to switch over to suppliers if, if, if there is a better one out there? And then what's the threat of forward integration? And you might remember forward integration is, is uh, suppliers moving forward into your space, basically doing your job. Um, is there a threat of that? And then if we move over to uh, the right side of that diagram to uh, power of buyers, when are the buyers powerful? We look at uh, buyers that are huge, huge uh, consumers of your product. Obviously, they're going to have a lot of power. Um, and in, in addition to just uh, large portions, we're talking about uh, um, revenue, uh, uh, buyers that, um, that provide a, a substantial amount of revenue to you. Of course, that's going to give them a lot of power. What about the switching costs in this regards? Um, the buyers, uh, would they have to pay a switching cost? In other words, they've gotten used to your products, your service, and um, and they're very comfortable with that. It works well or seamlessly with whatever they do. It might cost them if they want to try to go to a different, uh, a different supplier, a, a competitor of yours, if you will. And then what about uh, differentiation? Again, is there much differentiation in the industry? If there is, that could weigh have, uh, more heavily in your favor. And is there any threat of backward integration? So in other words, as buyers, could they come and do the same thing that you're doing? That, could give them more power. 
And then threat of substitute products. So um, what substitutes are there out there? Is there an attractive price performance trade-off? In other words, um, like the example of plastic for steel, um, if it can do the same thing for relatively the same amount of time, but for much cheaper, there's a danger of uh, substitute products then uh, moving into your space. And, and the same um, question about customer switching costs. So if the switching costs are low, that's gonna weigh against you. Um, and the last one was rivals, talking about rivalry. So we're looking here at your direct competitors. Uh, are there a lot of them? Does the industry grow fast or slow? Uh, is there a great deal of capital requirements, the high fixed costs, high storage costs uh, question? And uh, is there any differentiation? Are products pretty much, pretty much the same? And then what's the exit barriers look like? If somebody does want to get out of the business, is it pretty costly? Do they have specialized assets, fixed costs like labor agreements? Probably not in Georgia. But if we have any of those sort of things, then rivals are probably going to stick it out. Uh, even through a COVID environment, they may not, uh, they, they may feel like it's not worth it to, um, to leave the business. So um, some questions from all of this. Um, who are your buyers and your buyer groups? Um, customer buying criteria is a huge thing to me. You have to know who your customers are and you have to know why they buy from you. What's the reason they buy from you and how important is that reason? Does it make up 50% of their decision making? Does it make up just 25%? What are the other factors? Um, so buyers uh, and buyer groups and buying customer buying criteria is, is key. Um, you can ask the same thing about suppliers. If you have a lot of suppliers, um, who are they? And what is it you're needing from them? Are they providing it? Especially again, in this, in this pandemic environment. Who are your competitors as direct competitors or rivals? We're looking, um, looking at identifying them. And, and ideally you would want to look at uh, a SWOT analysis, particularly strengths and weaknesses of your direct competitors to see um, perhaps where they may be vulnerable. Um, are there substitutes out there? Same question that we just talked about. Uh, are there substitutes available? The typical plastic for metal kind of thing um, or other substitutes depending on your, on your business. And then potential new entrants, you may not know who those are until they're kind of late, but the higher the barriers to entry are, the more those potential new entrants will think twice and perhaps move on. So which ones of these are strong? Which ones are weak? And then how do we apply these things? Can we apply these to the five forces, the Porter's five forces? We could ask, why is the profitability level? And we're talking about industry-wide. Why is the level of profitability what it is? You know, is it completely due to COVID? Is it the restrictions are in place by um, city or state uh, governments, municipalities? What's causing the level of profitability to be what it is? So the controlling forces in that probability, identifying them, and then even within the industry as a whole, is it the same in the entire industry? Is it, is it an anomaly for you, your type of business, your location? Uh, what does the industry look like uh, as a whole? And then are there more profitable players? If there are more profitable players, how are they better positioned in relation to those five forces? Maybe you can learn something from them. Again, looking at the strengths and weaknesses of direct competitors. And then lastly, what effect will likely future changes have on these five forces? So again, if you think about six months to a year out, looking at those five forces, um, is COVID still here? What do you see? How can, uh, how can you be more profitable uh, given the, those five forces and, and, and trying to keep those arrows pointed out to, the, to, the, to, to, to all of those forces or as many as possible in order to retain your, um, your market space, that share of market. Okay, and so, whoop, time to see if everybody's still awake. Time for a new strategy. Maybe with all of that discussion, you might think, maybe I do need to relook at how we're doing things. Hopefully it's not exactly like Dilbert here. He's 
goofing off for just a little and probably nobody will notice, but good old dog bird there. <laughs> he's, he's just giving, uh, he's giving his owner no respect, right? Lame fort. So hopefully you don't have a lame fort, but if you do, perhaps it's time to look at a new strategy or a revising strategy. And if you remember, or maybe you've never heard of Porter's strategy matrix, all strategies are based on a plan and they look at a competitive advantage. My, my definition is the answer to the question, why customers buy from you? Whatever that answer is, that's your competitive advantage and it's going to be based on a continuum, either uh, a cost basis or a uniqueness basis, somewhere in that continuum between cost and unique. Normally, the closer you get to being more and more unique, um, the higher the, the costs are. So I look at that as a continuum. And then the scope of the markets, either broad or narrow market, and we'll look at that. Basically, from, from those four, um, we're going to develop five po possible potential business level strategies. So um, we see on the left side is the, the cost aspect of it, cost leadership and focus cost leadership, top and bottom. And then the right side is the uniqueness part, either differentiation or focus differentiation. The only reason the, the two at the bottom are called focused is because those are the narrow market scopes. So think about market segmentation and how narrow are you targeting your market. The more narrow you are, the more focused you become in your strategy. The broader you are, the more you're at the top of cost leadership or differentiation. And then that one in the middle, the fifth one, the, the integrated, it's, uh, it's just a little bit of, of, of both. So it's not one where you're strictly basing your, your strategy on cost, but you're also not strictly basing it on being unique or, or differentiated either. You're trying to walk a fine, fine line there. Let's look at these um, real quick. Uh, cost leadership. Obviously, advantage here is being a low-cost leader, and we're talking the broad market, so the top left quadrant. My example in class always is Walmart because everybody knows Walmart. So if you think Walmart is a cost leader, uh, they do this really well, no frills, standardized goods, um, and they've done a magnificent job of reducing costs in the, in the value chain, uh, especially with inventory control. Um, what's the... Uh, risk of being a cost leader, well, you're basing your whole strategy on price and price is easily imitated. It's uh, completely visible to all of your uh, competitors, rivals, and so um, given their ability to contain their costs, they can, um, they can imitate this uh, strategy relatively easily. So if we move over to the top right, that again, we're in the broad area and we're looking at differentiation. Um, my example on this is usually uh, Apple. Apple is very differentiated. Um, Panera Bread is another one. A broad market. Um, <clears throat> they're delivering goods or services that customers perceive are different, okay, in ways that are important to them. So again, we go back to customers and their buying criteria and how important it is to know why customers buy from you. So these target customers perceive product value, even though it could be, and oftentimes is a more expensive product, but they see value in it. So what, what are the risks here? Well, sometimes we can outprice ourselves, right? Customers determine the cost of the differentiation is too great. They don't want to pay that thousand dollars for a new iPhone anymore. Um, what are the means of differentiation? Maybe that means uh, cease to provide value. Again, again, the customer buying criteria are key here to make sure that customers um, really appreciate and want the, um, uh, the product or the services that you're, you're providing or offering. Um, counterfeiting can be a problem. Experience can narrow customers' perceptions. So they've, they've, they've bought it before, they, they understand it, they're just not, not feeling this, uh, this uniqueness anymore. It's kind of, kind of passed them by. On the other side, the bottom, I should say the bottom side, um, the two focus strategies. So it's focus cost leadership, focus differentiation. Again, the cost leader and differentiation 
uh, explanation is the same. The focused part is, is what's different here. So again, like it says, uh, firm's core competencies are used to serve the need of a particular industry segment. So I wanna think about market segmentation here. And you might be looking at a particular geographic market, but it also could be a particular demographic, a uh, specific uh, type of customer, again, a, a B2B, B2C type of customers. So however you um, slice that market, if it is a more narrow market, um, then you're probably gonna be in one of these focused categories. Um, I'd put uh, JetBlue in that category. It's not competing against the major airlines. Um, uh, Harley-Davidson is in this category. JetBlue on the focus cost leader side. Harley-Davidson on the focus differenti differentiation side. They both have their um, specific markets that they're, that they're appealing to, narrow markets. So what's the risk here? Um, something we call outfocus the focuser. <laughs> If the, if, the, um, focused, if the area you're focused on becomes very attractive, then the bigger players, the ones in the broad market, broad cost leader or broad differentiator, they could come down and try to grab some of your market. Um, this worked in reverse for Southwest Airlines. Southwest Airlines used to be uh, focused low cost. And as they continued in that, uh, in that space, uh, the larger airlines took note and tried to copy a lot of things that um, that Southwest was doing. So this uh, focus strategy firm is attractive and worthy of competitive pursuit. That was Southwest Airlines. And now Southwest has moved up to where it's, it's serving a broad market. But then we have JetBlue that's kind of replaced them down in that focused um, cost leadership space. So there are risks of this. Um, that fifth and last one then is the integrated. This is the one that tries to do a little bit of both. So it looks for efficiency to bring those low costs, but it also looks to provide some sort of unique value uh, in the differentiation space. And um, one of the things that, uh, or one of the examples I give of this is uh, Target. Um, I ask if you were uh, blindfolded and led into a big box retail store and uh, they removed your blindfold, would you, and you were in Target, would you confuse your location for, for a Walmart? And nobody would. Everybody knows when they're in Target that, that, that that's a Target. One, the colors are different, I get that but the place is different. It, it it's pushes into the unique space, but it still has a concentration on, on cost. So they're a good example of integrated cost leader differentiation. And maybe you could be in that space too. Um, there are risks though. The risk of the, of the integrated strategy is what we call stuck in the middle. When you're stuck in the middle, then customers really don't get it. They, they don't really see that you're low cost, um, but then also they don't really see that you're unique either. They're not really sure why they will buy from you and that's a huge problem. So to be stuck in the middle is, is, a, is a great risk for, for, uh, for the integrated strategy. So that kind of brings us to the end. Oh, almost, except for homework. So hopefully you didn't feel like this was homework. And hopefully you didn't feel like I've been a burden to you by assigning this next part. Um, hopefully you don't want me to help your enemies or let's just say rivals, direct competitors. But after having worked through this process, at least thought through this process again, sort of trying to decide of how you got to where you are. And now with this COVID environment, um, maybe it's time to kind of take a step back and really, for homework, think about those three bullet points. Um, what is your vision? And I'm talking about your new vision. Um, it can be short term, six to 12 months, it could be long term when we're talking long term, two to five years. That's probably really long, but um, six to 12 months at least. What's your vision? And from there, develop a mission and, and then set some goals. Um, so this concludes 
my uh, strategy for a COVID constrained environment. It was more back to basics, but hopefully interlaced with enough COVID speak that you're able to um, um, glean some ideas from it. And then, um, and then hopefully we'll be able to get together perhaps on a Zoom call sometime in the future. And uh, I'd be happy to answer specific questions that you may have. So let me see how I get out of here and I will stop the video. It's been uh, great sharing with you and I hope you enjoyed uh, the time we had together too. Thanks and bye-bye.